Here to introduce tonight's guest and serve as moderator for the evening is award-winning journalist and Blank Slate media publisher, Stephen Blank. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Blank. Thank you very much. Reverend, thank you. Thank you for all of you who are attending. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to make the introduction of our uh, guest, uh, County Executive Laura Curran. Um, I, we're going to start, I'll give you a little more background on Laura before we get going, but um, we're going to have a, the format of this evening is going to be, I spend 45 minutes asking questions of Laura, and then I turn it over to you. So we'll have a good evening and uh, hopefully we can get a lot of information and pr present a lot of, uh, shed a lot of light on what we're doing. Um, quick background, I think most people here are probably very familiar with Laura. Um, she's been in the news a little bit of late. Um, she is the, as I said, the county executive. She is the first woman to hold the, that office. Um, Laura began her career, as I did, as a reporter, in Laura's case, at the Daily News and the New York Post. And she specialized in in-depth features, often writing about Long Island. She was an adjunct professor of journalism at SUNY Purchase. And then she decided to join the Baldwin Board of Education, um, where she served from uh, 2011 to 2014 serving as president in her final year, and then serving three years as a Nassau County legislator before running for county executive and winning office. So we have a lot, uh, there's been a lot on Laura's plate and a lot of things that are going on that are of great interest, so I'm just going to dive in and we'll start our conversation. Um, there are a lot of topics that a lot of people are interested in, in Nassau County, none more than the reassessment that's taking right. place. Um, where are we with that? And, well, let's start with where were we and where, where are we now with that? All right, so I feel like I've got my whole spiel on this because I've been going to many community meetings all over the county about this very issue. So most of you probably, first of all, I want to thank the congregation for allowing us to do this here. Thank you for asking me to do this. And I want to thank all of you for coming, taking time out of your lives to, to sit and chat with us for a little while. When I took office a little over a year ago, I walked into a real mess. The assessments had been frozen by the previous administration right at the beginning. Um, so they'd been frozen for the better part of 10 years. So they were wildly obsolete. At the same time, there was a shift that had happened, um, and that was because taxes are very high in Nassau County, people grieve their assessment. I absolutely do not blame them for doing that. What happened was, when you grieved, you got a better formula for how your assessment was calculated, and therefore with the taxes that you pay, because the assessment decides your share of the tax burden. So people who grieved successfully year after year after year saw reduction after reduction after reduction. Those who grieved not so successfully or didn't grieve found that they had to take the, you know, pay back what the others were underpaying. So pretty much in every school district, it doesn't matter whether it was North Shore, South Shore, you know, wealthy, not so wealthy, you found about 50% of the property owners were underpaying and about 50% were overpaying. Some places it was maybe 45, 55, but pretty much 50, 50. So you basically had half of the taxpayers subsidizing the other half. In the meantime, the values had been so degraded, about a third of the value had eroded out of, out of the properties in that time. So when I ran for county executive, like everyone else, you know, we said, we got to fix this. We've got to fix this assessment system. It's broken. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the assessment system is one of the reasons why the county is so deeply in debt. With commercial properties, the county, if we lose a grievance, we actually have to pay that back with money. So that's been about $80 million a year that we have to borrow and pay back. That's money that we cannot borrow then for infrastructure fixes, for roads, and that sort of thing. So deeply in debt, wildly obsolete and inaccurate assessments. And I knew that we had to get it right. 
And it's funny, a lot of people say, um, why did you do this on your first year? It's, it's, you know, it's, just, it's politically very difficult. Um, and I, you know, I could have spent the first year doing the ribbon cuttings and the Girl Scouts and the parades and all the stuff that we love, but my conscience wouldn't let me. I knew that we had to do this reassessment. And I will say, to the previous administration's credit, uh, they did start a reassessment. They never finished it in time, and I don't know why. And working with our county legislature, we finished that reassessment. That is done. Um, the other problem we were left with is we have two departments that deal with assessment. It's the assessment department and assessment review. That's the, assess that's the department that deals with all of the grievances. Those staffs had been decimated, pretty much cut in half. Um, it, you got the sense of tumbleweeds. You know, I visited when I first got there and it was, hello, 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 with the empty cubicles, tumbleweeds and blowing through. Um, so we're working very hard to restaff. You know, so the, phone, the phones weren't getting answered. Um, the work wasn't getting done. So we're restaffing both of those departments. We're beginning to rebuild. We also have this ancient um, IT, this very antiquated IT that we have to deal with. And I don't know how many people here have computers that are 12 years older or older, but that's the kind of stuff we were dealing with. So we're, we're bringing that, working to bring that up to date as well. Um, and, and one other thing is there had not been an actual qualified assessor with the credentials running the department, which our charter, which is like our constitution mandates. So I recruited and hired a real credentialed assessor to do this. So I'm sorry this is a very long answer, but it's, there's a lot to it. Mm -hmm. um, where we are now is the assessment is done. We met with about 14,000 property owners one-on-one, -on -one, and um, through those, we made about 80,000 corrections to the assessment rule because it's 400,000 properties, commercial and residential, that had been frozen for so long. You know, mistakes can get made. It's been a bit bumpy. It's been a bumpy process. So we've made some great corrections, about 80,000 corrections, and we're in the grievance process now. So while I don't think you should have to grieve to get your correct assessment, because this is a reassessment after almost 10 years, if you think we are wrong, you absolutely should grieve, and that will help us get it right. So the question is, there, there has been, it's been 10 years, you're basically, you have a new person who is in charge as county assessor, um, there have been stumbles, and there's been a lot of, there's been several instances right. where things went wrong um, that were done, and recently um, the county Republicans, legis legislators, um, called for the firing of uh, David Moog, who is the county assessor, because they said he has, because of these errors. Um, what's your response to that? Is that is, is this something that they're, they're making the claim that this has been badly handled by David Moog and that somebody else should take, take his place? Well, I'll give you, there's two aspects to that question. The first is, you know, I'd like, I would like to address the, the, there have been glitches there, you know, there was the robocall that went out. There have been some, the, some mistakes and typos and that sort of thing. And anytime we find out about that, we get out in front of it and we fix it. Something that's been conflated into this sort of litany of mistakes is corrections that we've made. It's called the 511 process. In, Jan in, uh, in uh, November and December, meeting with the, our constituents, we made corrections to the role that are part of the process. So that sometimes gets conflated. But I have to say, we walked into a situation where half of the people were not there. Ancient IT. And we're fixing it. And I think for people to say, and I think it's kind of opportunistic to say, oh, fire the guy, after they sat by while an unqualified person held the job, the work wasn't getting done, the assessments were frozen, and you didn't really hear much at all then. Now that we're actually fixing it and getting into the mess of it and actually taking the bull by the horns and doing the work, to say that he should be criticized, I think is just terrible. I, I, to say that he should be fired, I think is just terrible. It's, uh, I, I, it almost makes me think, you know, how dare you? Finally, we have a credentialed assessor doing the work. And then to call for his resignation, is the status quo better? Is having a non-credentialed actual, you know, someone who doesn't have the qualifications for the job there, is that better? Is not doing the work of assessment better? Absolutely not. We've got to keep these assessments current so that we don't get in this mess again. We've got to make sure that these departments are fully staffed so that they can do the work. Uh, we're not raising property taxes in 2019, but 
We are investing money in rehiring scores of people to these departments. This is a county function. We're one of the only two counties in the, in the state that has this function of doing assessment. Uh, we got to get it right. Um, one of the other things that's happening, so the question is, this is going to be in effect for 2019, 2020? It's 2020, 2021. 2021. So the first time you'll see this impact in your taxes in the, your first school tax of 2020. Okay, so part of what's happened, and this has been a request that you have made and others, that there be a phase in, in the changes. So will you have a situation where for the last eight, 10 years, half of the county has been underpaying their taxes, and as a result, the other half has been overpaying their taxes. Why have a phase in? Because if you're gonna phase this in, and this was something that I think is now, the governor has put it in the state budget, if you've had people for eight or 10 years overpaying their taxes, why should they have to continue to overpay their taxes even though it's a lower amount each year. And yeah. the people that are underpaying their taxes continue to get that benefit for five years, even though it's not so much. That is such an important question, and it comes up all the time. Um, you hit it right on the head. So, right, you have people who've been overpaying and people who have been underpaying. Um, I worked hard to get in the governor's budget bill this five-year phase in so that any changes, increases or decreases, from this reassessment in your taxes takes place over a period of five years. It's the taxpayer protection plan. And to those who say, you know, well, I, I'm, I'm gonna be continuing to overpaying, I say if we did not fix this, you would continue to overpay even more. We've gotta get this right, and this shows why it's so incredibly important to get these right, so that you have everyone shouldering their fair share. But we've gotta start now. Um, I feel that those who were underpaying and those who were overpaying were kind of played by the old system because those who were overpaying obviously had to overpay. Those who were underpaying, those who set this up this way knew that this day of reckoning would come. They knew this was going to happen. They were just happy to kick the can down the road and let someone else deal with it. So those you know, who were seeing the Band-Aid getting ripped off, they were being played as well. Um, one, one other question, because I know there's so many other things that, that are going on, but this is, this is such an uh, important issue. There's now been a class action suit filed um, by people who were overpaying their taxes, and there's not a dollar amount, but potentially if everyone joined that class action suit and they won, I think, uh, I think Newsday did a study, and it was something like a billion dollars has been overpaid uh, by, by people. Um, is that a threat? And it's the second follow-up question to that is, Rich Nicoletto, the presiding officer, said that it's a plot by the Democrats um, to undermine the, I'm, I'm not sure what they're looking to undermine, but they think it's a, a plot to essentially, I think, bankrupt the uh, county. Um, yeah. what's, what's your response to, number one, is this a real threat that there's a class action suit that you have people that have been overpaying for years, now they're saying, hey, I was overpaying, give me back my money. So this, I can't, it's pending litigation, so I, I can't really talk about it. Um, I can say it's, it appears from what I read that it was, this is um, a result of action from 2010. And it just shows why it is so important to get the assessments correct. Um, this, I, I can't get into you know, what I knew and when I do it and all of that because it is pending litigation. Um, to, to characterize it as a plot by the Democrats I, I, is completely false. Okay. Um, let's, we'll, we'll move off assessment. I think there, there may be a question or two from the audience uh, once we open it up to Absolutely, them. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Recreational and medical marijuana have become a very big issue yeah. in the town of Hempstead and now across the county. Uh, the town of uh, North Hempstead has restricted where medical marijuana can be sold um, and, and the number of places where it can be sold. They have barred the sale of it anywhere. Town of Hempstead is looking at it and now the county. Um, there is a task force that you have 
um, put together, is that task force considering banning the sale of marijuana in Nassau County? So this task force that I put together uh, came before this opt-out option was, was floated, before we even knew about it. So it's a pretty small group. It's uh, business, health, law enforcement, municipal government, uh, community, faith, chambers of commerce, to look at all aspects of legalization and how it would affect us. So I am really looking forward to seeing what their recommendations are. I know that our county legislature had a hearing and a lot of people came and expressed their opinions. Um, one interesting aspect is, is the debate, it, the, the legalization is up to the state. So we're not debating legalization, we're debating how do we handle it here. The, uh, the legislation is still fluid. We don't quite know what it looks like. We don't know what the revenue necessarily looks like yet. So I am very eager to see what this task force has to say about it. Okay. Would and you, what their recommendations are. And I, I expect to be getting those recommendations next month. If they recommended ba um, banning the sale in all of Nassau County, would you, would you support that? I'm going to wait and see what they say. I'm very curious to see myself. Okay. Um, okay, we'll leave, we'll leave it for that. We'll look forward to it. Um, you had some strong comments about, the, about Amazon's decision oh. to not, to pull out of their yeah. headquarters, proposed headquarters in Long Island City. Yeah. Um, I didn't really see in the statement. We got the statement and I wasn't sure you said you'd welcome them back. Here's, here's the question. I asked them to please reconsider. Reconsider. Who do you think is at fault there? Oh, boy. I have to, I, you know what? I'm going to be very frank with you. I think it is pandering politicians who, uh, I was, I, I, you know what? Who, who was to blame? It felt like a body blow when I found out about what was going to happen. I had actually written an op-ed for Newsday about why this would really benefit our county. It would help revitalize our downtowns. It would make the case to our municipal leaders of why we need transit-oriented development, why we need to attract our young people. I'm thinking of all the ancillary businesses that could have grown up here, all of the fa young families that would have been attracted, all of the other tech that comes, tech attracting tech. Like we've seen in NASA, like we've seen in Silicon Valley, um, I thought about how uh, the tax base would have grown, which we desperately need here. We need to attract business, not say go away. Um, you know who is to blame? I think people can form their own opinions. I'm not here to cast blame, but I, I was incredibly disappointed by this turn of events. I, I guess one of the questions, one of the objections by the opponents that were there. Um, some of whom actually represented the district where it was going to be located, um, was the fact that you're giving $3 billion to a company that's made $14 billion last year and they're not paying any federal taxes this year on the earnings of $14 billion. Um, I guess the question is, and Amazon did make its money, and in part they earned it with providing a service, but in the process, they knocked out a lot of stores on our main streets. A lot of the local districts, they're out, that's how they made it with doing it. And now here we're gonna give them $3 billion at a time that Google is opening, putting up office space in New York City without any money, and some of the other tech firms are doing that. So how do we justify giving them, or any other large company, that amount of money doesn't that really give them a unfair advantage in the marketplace for every other retailer on every other local district that doesn't have the clout to get that type of, uh, that, those type of benefits? I, I hear what you're saying, um, and I get that argument, I really do. But the fact is, you have to attract companies, and you attract them with abatements. There were other municipalities, other places that were offering much more generous packages than, than what New York was offering. Um, and you talk about the three billion, but then there on the other side of the ledger, there's the 27 billion that would have been coming in, right? We're t you know, people are talking about extra train stations in Sunnyside, uh, beefing up our infrastructure, beefing, beefing up 
our, our transportation network in the region, bringing the jobs here and saying, yes, we are open for business here. You, can, it is, you know, it's hard already. Anyone who does business in Nassau County or in this region knows how hard it is. The taxes are high. It's hard, sometimes it's hard to find the, the, the workers with the right skills. You've got all the municipalities, to, you know, and the permitting and all that. It's very hard. So you, to, to make it even harder now, I think, is, is doing all of us a disservice. We have to really think seriously of how we're going to embrace the 21st century, making sure that we're growing our tax base, reversing the brain drain. You know, our population here is aging. We are not keeping young people because they just can't afford to stay, don't want to stay. Uh, and I really did see Amazon coming as a way to begin to turn that tide, to really sort of burnish our brand as a region and to say, yes, we are open for business. Um, just in terms of just, you know, in terms of the question of with, with, an, with an Amazon, there were local officials, though. And so I guess the question is, what role do local officials have in objecting to a large project? Um, in Nassau County, we have, they don't want marijuana. Now we don't want to sell recreational marijuana. There was the Lighthouse Project that was supposed to save that Charles Wang wanted to develop in the hub. Um, there were the lottery, the off-track betting lottery machines that were supposed to be in Westbury and Belmont. And local officials yeah. knocked those out. So the question is, how much can local officials reflect perhaps what some of their constituents, their concerns, in objecting to something local? I guess yeah. it's how much, how, how much nimbyism is allowed in, uh, in Queens and how much is it allowed out in Long Island? So you really do have to engage your communities. You really have to be very close with them and engage them. Uh, I, was, you know, I was just reflecting, I don't know if anyone saw the news about Lynbrook, if anyone's been to Farmingdale recently, Farmingdale has been completely revitalized. You can't park there on a Saturday night. It's really just a fun place to go. The, all, the main street had been pretty much half empty storefront-wise. Now it's completely full. And it was because there was a very forward-thinking mayor there and a, a wonderful housing development apartments right by the train station. That apartment complex revitalized that village. So in Lynbrook, the same developer was interested in doing a development. I don't know the details, I don't, I don't know everything that happened, but I did see, because of community opposition, they pulled the plug, they're not, they're not going to do it. Maybe they'll come back. So I have actually written, I'm gonna write a letter to the editor of the local paper saying, if they come back, or if someone comes back, let's work with the community right from the beginning on their concerns, address their concerns, because Communities have legitimate concerns that have to be addressed. But you can't really impose it on communities, but you can work together with them to make this happen. But you really have to be at the grassroots level. And you also have to show, and we've seen a lot of uh, mayors around our, you know, Mayor Strauss in Mineola, Mayor Ekstrand in Farmingdale, um, Jean Selander in Great Neck Plaza, the mayor of Great Neck also, you know, you got to have a little bit of courage and the, the ability to kind of withstand some of the anger and some of the uh, people who, you know, scream at you and say mean things. You have to be able to withstand that a little bit also. It's, you know, you got to be kind of tough and have a thick skin and also don't be afraid to engage the community where they are. And you're not always going to get what you want, you know. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, but you have to make the effort and I think you can't be too afraid of very angry people. And I often encourage people, you know, often the, the no's come out with the signs, we don't want this, we don't want that. They're not shy about coming out. The people who want it, not so much, they don't come out. And I always say, you know, you young people who wanted this transit-oriented development or you who want this to happen, I would love to see you be as obnoxious as the, as the no crowd. Come out and make your voice be heard. Um. If you didn't have enough trouble with your reassessment, um, we now have SALT. Yes. Which is, so yes. right now there is the Congress. We're feeling it now. Congress has passed legislation with the $10,000 cap on deducting state and local taxes, which um, is, there's a great deal of concern in New York State about. What do you see the impact of SALT in terms of because now people that they're 
probably any, a good portion of Nassau County and probably people living particularly in this, in this area are paying considerably more than $10,000 in this. So they're going to feel it. Their taxes now are going to cost them a lot more money. Um, what's the, what do you see as the impact for I am Nassau very, County? I'm very concerned about it for the county. I'm also concerned about it for the state. Nassau County, New York State, one of the heavily, most heavily taxed places in the country. Nassau County, forget about it. I think we're always vying for number one with Westchester County in terms of our, our state and local taxes. Um, I was at something that the governor, where the governor was speaking and he had this very striking statistic that I'm talking about everywhere I go. 93,000 New Yorkers, 93,000 out of the 18 million New Yorkers pay fi uh, close to 50% of the taxes. 90,000 are carrying half of the burden. These are people who are educated, who are mobile, who might leave, you know? I mean, uh, perhaps maybe some of them are starting to. This is, this is very, very concerning for me. And for, I, you know, not just me, I think it's just very concerning for our entire area. Um, do you see that, will this be reflected in and so, school budgets being and, defeated? And, is this gonna be well, put pressure on what people are willing to accept from local government? I don't know the answer to that. We'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, with, with Amazon going away, without growing the tax base, I don't want to sound so pessimistic. I do believe that we are still open for business in Nassau County. I do believe that we can attract business and we're working very hard to create that kind of business-friendly environment. Um, but this, the salt, the, the cap on the salt deductions is, is is very concerning, and I'm concerned that wealthy people will, will simply leave and further burden the middle class. Okay, transportation is also an issue and has been a um, source of complaint, and I think there, there are two things. One is the Long Island Railroad. Um, the issues and just the commute, because yeah. so many people here are commuting into uh, New York City into Manhattan for their, for their job. So I should not have a favorite constituent, but my husband is a daily commuter, and so I get an earful all the time about what's going on. So is there a role, what role have you been playing? Philip Bang, who is now the president of Long Island Railroad, is from East Williston. Mm -hmm. He's they're part of our uh, readership area. Um, have you had conversations? What role is the county taking? I know the state, state assembly, state senators have been very active in, uh, right. here in uh, calling for hearings. But what can be done, because that seems to be an important issue for the quality of life for people who live in Nassau County and for staying in Nassau County? Right, no, it's incredibly important. It's, it's, it's important, like, the, like pretty much everything else we've been talking about for our entire region. Um, we need a, a, a representative from Nassau on the MTA board, which we're getting, I understand we're getting closer to, which is good. Uh, and I, I talk to, I talk to uh, Phil Ang quite often about what we can do uh, conveying the complaints and concerns of, of the constituents that I hear from and that my staff hears from about what we can do. I am excited, um, we're just out seeing the, the second track, the opening of the second track out in Suffolk. Third track work is starting um, to help because we're at, we are seeing, despite the problems on the train, we're seeing more and more people ride the trains. So with this new infrastructure with the, set, with the third track, we're going to uh, be able to increase the capacity and get more people where they need to go more quickly, more efficiently. But there is uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. What do you think on the issue, and this is, this is a lot of hot issues here, but congestion pricing. Yeah. The governor has said that either there is congestion, congestion pricing, which means you have to pay a, a, a large uh, uh, fee if you're going to live, if you're going to drive into Midtown Manhattan, or he said you're going to see a doubling of the, of the Long Island Railroad fares. Um, yeah. This is not a popular thing for people drive, who drive no, into Midtown. No, and people who are already heavily taxed who come from the suburbs. Uh, so where, where, where do you could, stand on that? Because it's, you know, it you could don't... work if we get something tangible out of it. Um, the idea is that this is going to pay to fix the subways, which right. are falling apart. Right. And a lot of people here. The subways here and the rest of the whole network. If we get something tangible out of it for our taxpayers, it's something that could work. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
On the other side, there's developments that are taking place. So there is the hub yeah. um, that is taking place where there is now, RxR has come back mm -hmm. from, they were one of the people involved in the lighthouse. What is the status now of the of development in the hub and where do you see that? Where, where do you, where, where, what place does that have in Nassau County and, and what does that represent? So this, this is a real um, reason for optimism. We've never been further down the road of getting the area around the, our Nassau Coliseum, right in the heart of the county, done. Um, I have to thank our county legislature, who in a unanimous bipartisan, bipartisan fashion passed the development deal. So that's uh, Brooklyn Sports and Entertainment. They operate the Coliseum. They're the tenants. It's county owned uh, with Reckler, with RXR to do this development. It's already zoned with the town of Hempstead, so we don't need any zoning changes right now. It's zoned for 500 units of housing. And I also have to thank the Hempstead supervisor and the town board for really working well with us on this. Uh, for the first time, bipartisan, town, county, we're all kind of on the same page here. We're moving it forward. This is a real reason for optimism. So it's, it's zoned for the housing, uh, it five, 500 units of housing. Also, Northwell has, is committing to build, to ha inhabit 200 square feet innovation center, medical research facility. We are also looking at retail and entertainment to be part of the mix. So it's those three things, housing, jobs, retail, entertainment, looking at innovative ways that we can use green space, perhaps on top of the parking garage. Um, really very forward thinking. So this is exciting because it's going to grow the tax base, it's going to provide much needed housing and high wage jobs. But more important than that, I think it's really good for our self-respect as a county that we can get this done, that we can embrace the future and finally get something that's been stuck for decades because of political squabbling, finally get it done. Um, and I'm really bullish on it. So where we are next is the, uh, the development deal was signed. And Ken cannot thank our county legislature enough for that. Uh, what's that? Oh, oh, hello, county legislator Birnbaum. Nice to see you. <laughs> are we in your district? Yes. Oh, very good. So, oh yes, where we are. So, so that's done. Um, and I've, I've said a quick 24 months, a quick 24 months, quick to work out all the details. Uh, community benefits, working very closely. We're gonna be announcing soon the members of our community benefits group, advisory group, from stakeholders from throughout the county, because remember, stakeholder and community engagement is incredibly important. Project labor agreement to be worked out as well, along with the details of what the plan's going to be. So, and where is Belmont now? So this is, we know that they, yeah. I guess there was the latest was there was a delay do you see that going forward and there's I issues do. with I do. As, as there always is traffic and, and, right. and those issues? What does that represent in terms of the county? What, is, what does that do for Nassau? So that's a state thing, and I'm watching it very closely. I'm a Rangers fan, so if you oh, well, I'm a, back, I'm, I'm, I have I have become a, a big Islanders fan, and I have <laughs> to say I was really, really excited. I wrote a letter to the NHL commissioner, Gary Bettman, asking him to, if the Islanders, should they make the playoffs to play the playoffs in the Coliseum? And uh, he said, yes, so they're gonna play their first round at the Coliseum. I got a letter back from him officially today. It's already been in the press, but saying, um, yep, we, you know, it's not ideal for us, but because you asked, we're gonna do it. <laughs> so I was very happy about that. He, you know, I, from what I understand, Belmont is moving forward. I'm not as intimately involved with that because it's not, it's not ours, it's not the county's. And I know that there are some serious traffic concerns that have to be looked at. Um, and in the meantime, while Belmont is being planned and built, the Islanders are playing in the Coliseum a lot of their games. I've been to two, I'm gonna go to one next week. And uh, it's really exciting. I have to say the, the feeling in that, in that Coliseum is unmatched. Their fans really carry, I don't know if anyone here is an Islanders fan, but their fans really sort of carry them through and make them win. <laughs> It's great. Um, okay. On the other side, there are a lot of places in Nassau County where you have your traditional Main Street shopping district. Yes. Where they have Something empty storefronts. Yep. And it's really the, the sort of center, the, you know, the sense of community. 
that you have in places, a lot of it goes around these public areas where you have stores, where you go shopping, where you see your neighbors. Um, and now, in a number of areas, they're suffering. What, can, what, what ought to be done? Plus the fact, I'll just throw in, you have such a um, balkanized system of making decisions where New York City Mayor Bloomberg could decide to rezone the five boroughs. Um, in a place like Great Neck, there are four villages within a quarter mile of each other on Middle Neck Road. So what can be done to support the shopping districts here that have been historically the center of the community mm -hmm. but now have, um, have really, in some cases, fallen on hard times? Yeah. Well, there are three things. Number one, the nature of retail has changed. People are looking for more experiential retail. More people are buying online. Um, and you're right. If, Amazon. If Amazon. Well, it, it, it is a reality. Amazon or whatever. Um, and, and, and the fact that, yeah, the city and the city of the city does the cops. It does the schools. It does the roads. It does the zoning. It does everything. Here we have 64 villages, as many, just as many hamlets. We've got the three towns that are kind of like mini counties. We've got the two cities. It, it is balkanized. You're absolutely right about that. One thing that I'm very bullish on, and I was um, up in Albany lobbying for this, and... Um, is, is the internet fairness, internet to, so as it is now, if you sell over the internet and your company is based in New York, or you have a brick and mortar here in New York, here on Long Island, here in Nassau County, you gotta, you gotta collect sales tax. Those uh, who sell over the internet from somewhere else, from another state, sometimes do not have to collect sales tax. So they get the unfair advantage. So you have a mom and pop store who's paying very high school taxes, high property taxes, along with all the other difficulty of doing business here, permits, this, that, the other, and they have to collect sales tax, they are really at a disadvantage. So um, having it fair for everyone who sells in New York State, having to collect sales tax can help. It can help revitalize our downtowns, it can boost our businesses. And you know, I wanna say to people, ooh, what are you talking about? Why would you wanna tax this? I can go on Amazon, I can order something from somewhere else, and I can get it for cheaper. What are you doing this? Well, it's not a new tax, it's not a tax increase, but it's leveling the playing field so everyone has to play by the same set of rules. Our local businesses should not be penalized, you know, when others get this free ride. Now, the governor has said, or suggested, that this money is gonna to come to the county, to the counties. Yes, but, but, there was a big but there. But there's a but, he's, cutting money for aid to municipalities. So to make it up, he suggested that that money that's coming to the county be then given to the villages by the county. Is this something, if, so if you get this newfound money from online tax, sales taxes, um, do you think you should distribute it to the villages? all 64 villages, um, or do you think that should be, stay with the county? Well, obviously I would like to keep it all for myself, and for our, you know, we're under NIFA control, we are about to start collective bargaining, you know, we, we need the money. However, if, I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever the law is, I'll do whatever is appropriate. Obviously, I think we, we're, in, we're in dire need of revenue. There is an over-reliance on property taxes here in Nassau County. We need to find other kinds of revenue. Should there be a property taxes, even when you get the system right, is unfair because you're taxing people not by their ability to pay, but by what they owe, as opposed to an income tax. Would you consider an income tax for Nassau County? Well, that, that, that would, that would be has. a much longer and more complicated conversation. I th you know, we've, we've got the system that we have now. I have heard, ab um, and you know, a lot of people have said to me, well, what about an income tax? Everything has unintended consequences. You know, that's something we can think about, but. Okay, one, one final, you, you put your finger on it for the last, since the year 2000, Nassau County, which is one of the wealthiest counties in the United States, has been under financial supervision by the state of New York um, because basically it didn't have enough money to cover its bills in the year 2000. Um, 
Is there anything that you're doing to make that go away so that Nassau County doesn't have somebody, so that somebody is not needed to supervise Nassau County's finances? Absolutely. Um, you know, decisions made by the previous administration have put us in this control period, and I am very eager to get out from under that yoke so that we can, you know, be the masters of our own domain. Uh, we have collective bargaining coming up. We're also looking for um, other sources of revenue. Uh, we're not raising property taxes this year. We're, we're doing more. I know it's a cliche, but we are doing more with less. We're trying to be as efficient as we possibly can, and we're just going to continue doing that. Okay. All right, well, we promised that we'd let the audience have their say yes. and ask their questions, so we're gonna turn this over to, uh, uh, to the audience to uh, ask their questions. I'd like to know, um, why the county executive has reversed her decision that she made to remove ice from the jail property. Um, I live in Port Washington where there is a significant number of immigrants and people in my community are being terrorized by ice. I am afraid to, I witnessed a crime last year. I was afraid to call the police because I was afraid that someone would end up being deported. So I really don't understand why you are acting like ICE's real estate agent and why you are falling for the racist um, propaganda that's coming out of Washington. All right, thanks for the question. I want to make, I want to make something absolutely clear to you and to your neighbors. And uh, our police department has a policy and that policy is, and, and I think every, I don't know if everyone knows this, and I, I say it everywhere I go, policy is, if you're a victim, witness, or have information about a crime, your immigration status is irrelevant to our police. And that is incredibly important, because if people are afraid to come forward, if they're, for instance, um, victims of sex trafficking, domestic violence, if they know about drug dealers down the block, or, or you know, gang members who are terrorizing the neighborhood, and they're afraid to come forward, that is a serious problem. It makes our families, our communities less safe, and it makes it the, the, the job harder for the police. And that's, you know, building trust is incredibly important. As to the previous question, so I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of you followed this in the, in the news. Uh, there was a decision in Suffolk against illegal detainers, and so I had decided that we should move the, you know, because I was not looking for mistakes to be made, to move the ICE agents somewhere else to the hospital, that didn't work, so they stayed where they are until we find them a more suitable location. I do think it is important that we keep our federal agents, including ICE, in Nassau County. We need to work with our federal partners appropriately so that we can keep our, can continue our historic crime lows and keep our communities safe. So working with our federal partners in a responsible way, abiding by the law, and also building trust in our communities um, and, and really letting everyone know that the police, your immigration status is irrelevant if you have information about a crime or, or, the, that, or are a witness. Except that to say that it's irrelevant and still have ICE in so close quarters with our police means that even if someone is released from custody, they've committed no crime, ICE is standing right there and picks them up. So you can say all you want that we're not cooperating with ICE, but we are. And this is a group that is terrorizing people in our community. There are mothers that are afraid to go to the grocery store because they're afraid that they'll be picked up by ICE and taken away from their children. And your job is to protect the residents of Nassau County, all the residents, not to cooperate with the felon in Washington. Well, let's, let's thank you. Hi. Hi. My question's written down, so it'll be brief. Um, thank you for this evening. My question is, I have personal experience with, and have done extensive research, on the hiring process for the Nassau County police officers. This county is uh, one of the only in the country who discriminate in their hiring practices of people with disabilities, an example of that being type 1 diabetes. Now, due to the applicant's litigations, the county hires and outsources attorneys costing 
our county hundreds of thousands of dollars to fight this. My question is, I'd like to know if there's any plan of revamping or reviewing policy and procedure in hiring and being in compliance with the Equal Opportunity Commission guidelines. Can you please be as specific as possible? Because as of now, Nassau County is one of the only counties in the country who is not in federal compliance with the discrimination issues that are existing. And I am not in a litigation at this time, so I am free to speak of that. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm gonna, I heard what you said. I'm gonna take your concerns and I'm gonna speak to our police commissioner about this. And if you give your name and number to Kyle, who is somewhere floating around, I will call you back. Okay, Ms. Okay. Corinne, um, that's great and I do appreciate that. However, Nassau County is one of the only, um, has one of the only hiring, um, I'm sorry, I'm just a little nervous. Because you're doing hiring, fine. What's that? I said you're doing fine. Thank you. One of the only hiring, um, policies in the country that goes through civil service, they do not use the police department to hire their police officers, which is part and parcel of why this problem is existing. So it's going through civil service people that um, really are not knowledgeable in the matter. Our police commissioner is outstanding, but unfortunately, and he is aware of the situation, um, but it's out of his control. This has to do with civil service. Civil but service. I'd love That's to right. give you my phone number. Okay. And again, I'm not Kyle's in right pending litigation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. Um, scientists say that climate change is the biggest crisis that humanity has ever faced. And yet when I looked on the internet and I found the budget of Nassau County for 2019, I did a search for the word climate change and it didn't appear anywhere in the budget. Why was climate change not mentioned in the budget and is there money budgeted to address this issue? So that is an excellent question. It's in, uh, we have a lot of, pro a lot of projects going, th usually through DPW. I'll just give you one example. We are, uh, we just got NIFA approval to begin design phase of a um, effluent, sewage effluent diversion project. So I don't want to get too in the weeds with this, but this will really help clean up our South Shore, Western Bays, and Reynolds Channel. Um, Bay Park Sewage Treatment Plant puts its effluent right out into the channel. Um, it looks clean, but it's very nitrogen rich, which chews away and degrades our marshland down there. That marshland acts as a natural buffer for storm. Uh, if we don't have that, we're getting, we're getting flooded and you know, we're seeing more storms, we are seeing some erosion, so we need to keep that marshland as, as firm and as healthy and thriving as possible. So uh, there had been a plan to do an outfall pipe right out from there, uh, two miles off into the ocean. Way too much money, we weren't getting money from the state, we weren't getting money from the federal government. So our very smart people in our Department of Public Works had a kind of eureka moment. And they said, hey, wait a minute, isn't there a huge viaduct that goes uh, right under Sunrise Highway. So bottom line is, um, of about seven miles down the road, there's another, out, there's another sewage treatment plant called Cedar Creek. That does have an outfall pipe. So the plan is to bring the sewage, the treated sewage from Bay Park up to Sunrise Highway, shoot it down, and, and this is a sound pipe, it's an old pipe and it's a very sound pipe, and then bring it down, it never comes above ground, and then shoot it out through, um, through the Cedar Creek outfall pipe. So that is moving apace, which is very exciting. Um, we have um, opened up a three, about a three, I think I believe it's a three acre, I, I'm not sure of the number, three acre solar panel farm down at Cedar Creek as well. Um, we have some other projects going, for instance, up in the North Shore there in the Manhasset area, there are a lot of unsewered homes, about 600 homes, I believe that are, un maybe even more than that, that are unsewered. No, the 600's down in Point Lookout. Um, there are many homes in the North Shore that are unsewered, have old and failing, aging septic tanks. We have some grant money to fix that so we don't have as much leaching, uh, as much of the nitrogen leaching into the ground up there. Um, we are also going to turn the uh, Long Beach sewage treatment plant into a pumping station and then bring that over to Bay Park, get it treated there, so that we have even less effluent going into our, going into our water. I mean, there's, we also have, um, 
open space. We, working with the legislature, we have about 600 acres of open space throughout the county, a lot of which we've now opened up for public use. You can go on our website and see where they are, where you can park, what, you know, so that you can enjoy the nature that we do have left here in Nassau County. So those are some of the things we're doing. So it's not in its own pocket. It's, you know, whether it's the Parks Department, Department of Public Works, it's all in there. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I just wanted to ask, uh, regarding the potential uh, legalization of recreational marijuana, have you considered uh, how potential tax revenue from that could help us get out from under NIFA control? And in the case that perhaps the uh, Republican majority legislature decided to opt out for purely political reasons, would you consider vetoing such an opt out? So it's funny that you call it recreational marijuana. Someone who is, um, who is for it <laughs> said to me, Call it adult use cannabis. That's the lingo. Adult use cannabis does not sound like fun, right? <laughs> Whereas recreational marijuana, <laughs> that sounds great. So, uh, but, but seriously, uh, I'm going to wait and see what my task force recommends. Uh, I'm, I'm going to wait and see. Now, the thing that I would caution people, and I've spoken to some of the legislators about this, if we opt out, it's still going, if, it, if it's legalized in the state, it will still be legal to own it and to consume it in Nassau County. It just will not be legal to sell it. So you would not be getting the revenue. So, you know, opting out isn't saying, no, you're not allowed to do it. It's not saying it's illegal. It's just saying that you can't sell it here. So um, I hear your question. I'm going to wait and see what the task force recommends, and we'll take it from there. Will you be attending any of the upcoming uh, public hearings? Or? Uh, not, I'm not going to the task force. I don't want to go to the task force's public hearings because it's theirs. I don't want, you know, if the county executive is there, I don't want to sway it one way or another. It's their show. They're getting the input. They're, they're, they have all, a lot of subgroups, subcommittees studying all aspects of this, the health aspects, the financial aspects, the law enforcement aspects, um, the commercial aspects. You know, it's what the chambers are involved with this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Hi, Supervisor. Um, Hello. I have a two-part question. It involves, I'm from the South Shore. We're sandy people that haven't been home in over six years. Where do you live? Oceanside. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I know you've been very helpful. You've passed on some things to consumer affairs, to yeah. uh, office of consumers. Okay, so we lived there since 1956. Wow. I live with my family. My father passed two years ago. My mother's 88. We're mm. not home in six plus years. Okay. We successfully grieved our taxes for many, many years. So, my, so, so what I basically want to say is, if we grieved it, it was not against the law, you were allowed to do it. Right. Why should the people that have a low, and I'm not complaining about the taxes now, I'm complaining about fair market value. Why should we be penalized because it was offered to everybody throughout the county to grieve taxes, but people just decided not to do it? So what happened is, this year, our taxes, our fair market value went from $258,000 to 409,000 with the new correction, with a predicted value of over $512,000. Our house is nowhere near done. We also had the contractors who disappeared, okay? Mm. So how can you predict in a house that has not been lived in for six plus years, a predicted value, and just going from the fair market value to the taxes that are gonna be for the uh, 2020, 2021, it's over 58%, okay? In those reports that were sent around one of the times that, with all that fiasco, um, we have comparisons of, they gave 60 valid sales in my neighborhood, okay, of which five are only a split level house, which is what we have, five. But they sent 60 comparable houses of which they're either a third to a 50% bigger than ours, have built-in pools on the water, extra bathrooms, two-car garage, Can you we know. just ask you your, the whole your, deal, your right. question. No, and but finally, what? right, so you have these comparables. We have zombie houses along, you know, with hundreds of houses along the South Shore. You, you know what's going on. Okay, and finally, they ended up comparing our house to a house, and I have the paper with me, to, it's on the website, to a house, and I didn't know where it was, I didn't recognize the street, and I Googled it. It's in a place called Bountiful, Utah. Wow. Okay, we went, we made one of those appointments, we went up to the assessor's office, the girl stood behind the counter, 
talked to us for two minutes and said that's what it, it is, you were getting discounts and blah, blah, blah. So who can we go and talk to about this? And so at this point, a Sandy house, let me just say one more thing, a Sandy house, how can you compare a Sandy house that's not been lived in to any house except another Sandy house? Well, the, that's an excellent question. Um, by the way, you said you worked with our Office of Consumer Affairs with a contractor. Uh, yes, I had sent you a congratulations letter when you were elected, girl power. Thank you very much. And but our, but our Office of Consumer Affairs was helpful? Uh, we have a case. Uh, okay. He left a year and a half ago. We're waiting to get on a docket for a hearing. I believe it's going to be next month. Okay. But you know the issue with that, and that, that's the second part of my question, is who do we need to speak to? We had a meeting with Commissioner May, who was very helpful and very nice, and they're changing the department. But who do we go to to change the laws? Because people on the North Shore wouldn't even know, and they'll think I'm nuts, that not only do these guys that steal hundreds of thousands of dollars from, that, from literally hundreds of homeowners, but they get probation, and then they cry because they won't have money to support their families for all the money they stole from the homeowners and get weekend jail if they get anything. Who can we go to? Because we've been to, you know, the senator, Governor Cuomo. Okay, why don't, why don't we let, why don't okay. we let the county Thank executive uh, Curran <laughs> answer the question? So, to your main question, if you think your assessment is incorrect, you oh, should grieve. absolutely yeah, should, I mean, yeah. should grieve. Now, I, I don't want, I don't want to get it too much into your particular case. Right. The tax, have you seen the tax impact of this assessment? Because we have some people who, whose assessments have doubled, but yet their taxes we, are the same. Maybe less, maybe a little more, but nowhere near the proportion. It's never, it's very rarely, not basically, actually it's more than 99% of people's assessments have gone up because they were so wrong, because they were so obsolete. So you can have people have a doubled assessment, but their taxes are the That's same. That's why I said or the down, fair market. perhaps. Right. Yeah. Okay, we do get a lot of discounts because And you might want to check what the ta how the tax impact is. And, but is know, there any way that we will know exactly what our tax is now for 2021? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, but they wouldn't discuss it. Nobody would discuss it. Well, it was like I, a two-minute conference and that Listen goodbye. to me. Listen to me. Can you please <laughs> give your name and number to Kyle? I will get you that number. That's very easy. It's, okay. You can do it online. Um, we, you should have gotten a letter in November. If you didn't get the letter, I'll make sure that you get the information. Okay. And is there anything that's going to be done regarding... It's not consumer's fault that they can only do so much to these guys that disappear, but is there anybody who can do something to change these laws to help the homeowners? Well, that's something we absolutely have to look at. That's done on the state level, so we can talk to our state guys about that. In the meantime, um, our district attorney can take these cases if there's real illegality happening. Yeah, but you know what? And I can tell you 25 people I know that have gone there, and we, everyone is advised, as long as a nail is put in through a stud, work is done. And you realize that most of this money is stolen from state money because people got it through grants with FEMA and New York Rising. Okay. I live I on the South we, Shore too, so I know I think exactly we need to move about. on to some okay. other okay. questions. Okay. All right, and there's Kyle. Hi, thank you for coming. Hello, sir. Uh, we had a disaster in February of last year with in the shooting in Florida, and uh, you called together a, a group of people which I read about on Newsday, and you got, got the, the picture taken and you said what you said. Uh, meanwhile, Congressman Swazi and Congressman King reached out to New York, to their county, to their town, school board members. Now, you were a former school board member. I have been a school board member right here in North Hempstead in, in my ninth year. Which district? East Williston. You did not reach out to school board members at all. I accepted it that you were busy and it just wasn't on your mind. The two congressmen did. I took it as a political thing and, and that's okay. But you sat there tonight and talked about your marijuana task force and I counted eight entities that you listed. Education is there, sorry, I, I you forgot You didn't them. say schools Educators. or school boards. Yeah, I have it here but I didn't, I didn't look okay. at my notes, yes. Education is absolutely uh, one of the you. stakeholders. Because thank you. There's nothing to me, well, I won't say there's nothing, but the marijuana issue and the school safety issue need school board members or at least superintendents involved in it. And the feeling that I get, in fact, we wrote you a letter, the East Williston Board, about this, is maybe you weren't happy as a school board member, I don't know. But no, I need, love the experience. Let me address your question. Sure. So working, 
when Parkland happened, it was one of those many nor'easters that were, that were here. I'm sure you remember last year. And the police commissioner came to me, we had, it was in the middle of a big storm, came to me that morning after and said, I got an idea. I got an idea. He told me what it was. I said, go for it. Do it. And this was, it, it, some of our school districts had the RAVE app. This is expanding it to all of our school districts. Now I believe all 56 yeah, have it. They do. My local one just signed on to it. Um, that was part of the plan. The other part was having police officers visit a school building during their tour so that every school building is visited during the day um, so that the police officer knows the lay of the land, God forbid there's an emergency, that there's a presence there that would um, discourage from bad actors from coming. Um, and the thing with the RAVE app is to reduce the response time. You know, there's a lot of debate as to whether you should arm school personnel or have armed guards at schools. That aside, I, I personally do not think that's a good idea um, because the guy could just come shoot the guy and then go and go about his merry way. Um, but if we have, um, with, this, with, this, with this RAVE app, it reduces the response time, right? If the, res if the response time is reduced, you have fewer people getting hurt. God forbid that there's an active shooter. So we take this incredibly seriously. Um, this has worked out very well for us so far. You know, we never want to have a disaster or a nightmare happen here in Nassau County, and we're doing everything we can to reduce the chances of that happening. So, and I have to thank our school boards and our school superintendents have been incredibly helpful in implementing this and working with our police department. So I thank you. I thank you for your service. I know it's a very difficult job being on the school board. Your pay doubles every year, so that's a good thing. <laughs> it, it's thankless and it's difficult, and I appreciate your service, and I appreciate your question as well. Good evening. Thank you so much for meeting with us. My name is Osmond Canales. Uh, I'm a longtime advocate for the immigrant community. I have relatives that live in South Nassau County that are immigrants, undocumented, and they're very concerned right, with the relationship between police and, and ICE. Um, but my question is specifically, um, I would just want to express how concerning it is to have ICE at the county jails because it puts our community at risk. There are cases where uh, individuals without any conviction has been taken by ICE because ICE is located in the jail. Uh, so my first question to you is, uh, where are you thinking to relocate ICE? I don't know yet, but we're looking for a suitable place that works for everybody. I hope that is not at the facilities of the county jail. Again, ICE is not a county agency, so they should look for a place for themselves. My other question that is also very alarming is, uh, we all may have read the article on New York Times with the um, immigrant uh, student who was picked up by ICE uh, while when the information was sent from police uh, that are at our schools. Um, that happened in Suffolk County. But I have news for you all because that is happening in Nassau County as well. Uh, we have cases of students that have been labeled as gang members without any evidence whatsoever. We know that there are SROs in our schools in Nassau County. Um, and according to immigration documents, right, the information comes from those SROs in our schools. And these are youth that have no criminal records whatsoever. And I want to emphasize we're not here to defend MS-13. We're not right. here to defend criminals. But these are innocent children that go to our schools that have no criminal records. So my question to you is, would you support uh, an establishing an MOU, a memorandum of understanding between the schools and the police to prevent police to send this information to ICE. You know, I, I thank you for your question, and I just want to reiterate, our police, our police are not here. Their job is not to take people who are going to school, going to work, going about their business, and cart them off. That is not their job, and that is not what they do. If there is a bad actor, if there is someone who is a criminal, then you know all bets are off. But if you're going about your business and you are a law-abiding person, you are safe in Nassau County. But only an MOU will guarantee that. Because right now, as I say, there are cases of children 
that have been sent to, that have been picked up by ICE. So only a memorandum of understanding will guarantee that to us, and it will also protect not just the immigrant students, but also other students, the school personnel, and as well as the police. Thank you. Thank you. Hard to follow that. Um, my question is, is about your comments earlier about the assessment process. Yes. I was one of those people, I don't know whether you said 80,000, 8,000, people who visited one of the satellite offices earlier. 14,000. 14,000, yeah. okay. Uh, to visit Which one did you go to? Uh, Christopher Morley. Okay. And um, they were very nice. I, I definitely got more than two minutes. And I had a, a, a lot of documentation with me. And the consensus, actually another two staff members came over and were looking at what we had. And the consensus was that there had been one of those, I, we referred to it as fat finger type of thing, a reversal of digits. Um, it was pretty obvious. Um, and the person we spoke to took all the information and said that it was going to go to some woman in the Mineola office who would do the correction. My question to you is, I've been waiting since January 3rd. Every day I go on the website and check it's the to, same? It's exactly the okay. same. And, and although I do plan to, the land I'm talking about, and I, to the, the, for the benefit of your audience, I won't get into all the details, but it's a, it's a conservation, it's vacant land, conservation easement to the village of okay. Roslyn, uh, uh, covenants uh, to the Roslyn Landmark Society, can't do anything with the land, and it's gone up from about 100,000 to over 500,000 for vacant land. And, so I'm definitely going to grieve it, but they said don't grieve it until we make the correction. And the person said I'll change this, and it didn't get changed. Yeah, they said they me? took it all down, and they said we're going to send it in to. There was apparently a person in Mineola who did the correction. I do have copies of the documentation. If I give it to Kyle, the Kyle, girl, he, he just I saw him walk. He knew. I uh, my, my my question really was how long should it take for the correction to get it done? It should not take this long. It shouldn't take no, two months. No. no. Okay. Absolutely I, not. I'll give it to all to Kyle. Yes. And thank I, you very much. We will much sort it out. Absolutely. Thank you. You know, I, it, these happen because you know we. It's a bear. It's four hundred thousand properties reassessed. We want to get it right, and you know, it's, we need you to help us in some of these cases to get it right. Yes, please. Thank you. I'm a member of the Nassau County Jail Advocates, and I'm the Criminal Justice Chair for NAMI Queens Nassau. I'm very unhappy about the fact that we had a 20-year-old young man who just died in the Nassau County Jail who was a drug addict, and also I would like to know that why Nassau County is not availing itself of free training to help correction officers deal with inmates. Uh, it's provided, it's free by New York State, and yet they still are not receiving this training. That's my first question. You said free? Yes, free. Stepping up initiative and serving safely are the two ways to get the free training, which I've already provided details to your office. Okay. So I'd like to know about that. And I'd also okay. like to know what is happening to reduce the number of people with mental illnesses in the Nassau County Jail? Why aren't they going to alternative placements where they can get services, not punishment? Hi, Hi Susan, Susan. Goddard, New Hi, York Susan. Civil Liberties Union. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? I'm okay. Um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, first of all, in, when we say we're cooperating with ICE, we have the trailer on the property of the jail, we know that there are faxes and emails that are sent to ICE as people are released. We don't have specifics about the level of charges at which that is done. My guess is it's anybody who might be undocumented. And then at the same time, you want us to say trust Nassau County. Yet, there's so much proximity between the police, the sheriff, and ICE. And so, how do, we, how do we say to the communities that they should be able to trust? The other question I have is about what's going on in the schools. Again, proximity. The police, Commissioner Ryder said the other night, that the police are actually inside the schools, teaching the kids about gang prevention and self-esteem. Now, why would the police be teaching kids about self-esteem? And why would the police be in the schools 
teaching. There's something called the school to prison pipeline where we're trying to minimize exposure to authorities like the police. There are children in the schools that are frightened of the police because of their family situations. So that's my question. Why are the police teaching inside the schools like that? And if they are, can the Civil Liberties Union come in and teach next to them? Or can we at least see the curriculum? Okay? And then finally, um, if you could explain what the DHS liaison position is. Because Commissioner Ryder said, and we know that there are, there's something called the DHS liaison position. That's a, that's a liaison to the Department of Homeland Security inside the schools, or at least on the perimeter, or in some way, shape, or form, near these children who could be at risk. How is it possible that the federal government can be anywhere near our schools? And what exactly is the nature of the information sharing that's going on there? All right, so I'm gonna have to talk to our police commissioner because I wasn't in these conversations that you had with him. You know, I don't know what the conversation was exactly. I'm not saying that you're saying it's something different, but let me talk to him and then I will call you, okay? And yes. I will get you those answers. Because I'm not going to answer this based on um, something that you're telling me that he said. Okay. okay, are you aware of the fact that they're teaching in the schools? I don't know what that means, teaching. Maybe they're visiting and they're doing a workshop. I don't know what that means. Okay. So let me get some more specific information and I have your telephone number and I will yes. call you. Yes, and publicly I have to ask you again, will you meet with the advocates about the ICE trailer? Yes. Thank you. Thanks for taking my Hi, question. Hi, of course. Pete Gaffney, Westbury Call Place School District. Nice uh, to meet you. Two things. Uh, tonight, during the conversation, you've mentioned high taxes. Yeah. Quite a bit. Yeah. What's your plan to reduce some of those taxes? Well, one thing we're not doing is raising them this year, which I think is incredibly important. And we need to uh, find other ways of getting revenue. Um, this internet sales tax can, be, can bring us tens of millions of dollars. That's a big deal for our budget. We're going to start collective bargaining soon with our municipal unions. So we are looking for a deal that's responsible for our workers and also really responsible for our taxpayers. The other thing we have to do is grow the tax base. We over rely on our property taxpayers. That means creating a more business friendly environment. It means helping our municipalities and supporting them when they want to do transit oriented development, walkable downtowns. You know, young people want to live by the train station. They don't necessarily want a car. They want to be able to walk to get their bagel and their coffee or their newspaper, if they even read newspapers anymore, not on their phone. Um, we, when you have a place, a vibrant, fun place that young people want to live, like Farmingdale, like Rockville Center, like Mineola, like Patchogue out east, then the businesses come. They want to go where the cool kids are. So we have to do everything we can. At the county level, we're not in charge of zoning. That's up to the towns and the villages. So it's very important that the county work with the towns and the villages to help implement this vision that we need to grow the tax base, being more business friendly. Those are some of the things that we can do. Thank you. I have one other thing. Yeah. Back last March, you have a survey about our infrastructure is falling down and it's just in yes. bad shape and you yes. wanted to have the roads analyzed. Yeah. I sat back, I waited till the end of August, I wrote to your office got a response back that it was approved that you were going to send the list to me. First four phone calls, you didn't receive it yet, you didn't receive it yet, this is from your constituent service. Very friendly, but you didn't receive it yet. On the fourth phone call, I find out, oh, we decided not to do it to save money, so the state was going to do it. So that's right. what I heard. Five more phone calls. But I do have some news for you on that. Five, I would hope so, it yeah. should be done, because uh, five more phone calls, a total of nine phone calls to your office. On the ninth one, I found out that the state just completed it. This was three weeks ago, and I should be able to see it in about 10 days, maybe two weeks. This was three weeks ago. This is Can I get the, it? This is for the infrastructure? infrastructure this was, yeah, this was the road, road survey analysis so that New York State we, did. Yep, the state is, we've got state, we're doing it with us through the state, through this thing called NIMTIC. For those of you who know, it's a regional transportation thing. I, I but, understand. but the news that I have for you is this. So we, this year, 2019, are on track to pave 130% more of our roads, of our county roads, than we did two years ago. The county's in charge of 1,500 lane miles in the county. You've got state, village, town, 
county. County's in charge of 1,500. So we're going to, to uh, a couple of years ago, we did about 80, 80 lane miles. This year, we're, we're on track to do 130, or 100 and, oh gosh, I can't remember. I understand, DPW, I know how bad shape they've been. Yeah. It, the roads have been ignored. We pay ridiculous taxes. The road's gotta be cleaned up. I understand that you've tripled your budget for roadway. Yeah. I understand all that, but can 175 I see- 175 lane miles, sorry, it just came to me. Can I get the report that I've been promised since October 5th? That's all I'm asking. Okay, all right. Where's Kyle? We'll get your name and number. All right, Kyle, you have a new friend. Kyle's gonna be a busy guy you tomorrow. a new friend. Hi. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name's Cheryl Keschner. We got about five minutes. Hi, uh, here this evening on behalf of Long Island Language Advocates Coalition. I've seen you, yes, many yes, times. Yes, we have met many times. It's nice to um, see you. Well, we've met. Uh, uh, but um, in uh, 2013, your predecessor had signed uh, two executive orders which were mandating language access at the county agencies. And M that mandating was, what? Uh, language access oh, language at access. all county yes. agencies, yes. right? Yes. Which was in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 which requires all agencies receiving federal funding. Yeah, we've funding. made great strides with that. Oh, you, I'd like to hear about the strides that you're making. We met with you in April of 2018 and really haven't heard anything back since that time. So although I know the police commissioner made an announcement about um, getting some uh, additional um, iPhones and tablets, we don't know how many are actually being used in the field. There's also social services, mental health, and all those other agencies. So what's being do, done to ensure that all county employees are being trained in how to provide language access, that the proper tools are at their um, disposal, and um, that there are enough bilingual staff in order to serve the public. Right, so the question is about language access. So one thing that you refer to is um, using no taxpayer money, using asset forfeiture money, there's a translation, spontaneous translation um, app that our cops can use when they stop people. Um, and you know what, I, I'm gonna get your name and number as well, I'm gonna call you because there's a whole big Megillah that I can give you, but let's do it offline. Okay, yeah, we'd okay. like to hear more about what's happening. And if, I, mean, I just may make one other comment in, regarding some of the policing issues. Um, if the commissioner and if the county does want to establish trust with the immigrant community, one concrete thing that they could do would be to emulate what New York City has done, which is um, when, when somebody gets arrested, their fingerprints are taken and they're sent to uh, the FBI and then to Homeland Security. But in a situation where it's a, a minor crime, where it's a misdemeanor, that does not have to be done. And in New York City, they have enacted a policy to not do that in certain situations, to just issue a desk appearance ticket rather than make an arrest. And I'm asking if Nassau County can do something like that because that will put far fewer uh, immigrants at risk when they um, have contact with law enforcement. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Oh, How Mr. Diamond. Yes, uh, Bradley Diamond. I'm a real estate broker with Lee and Associates. And I'm one of the guys who's on the street trying to fill all of those vacant stores that are thank up you. and down. Thank you. Stores. And it's very difficult. And one of the biggest problems we have Crazy. is the building departments, whether it's, you know, North Hempstead, Hempstead. It could be locally uh, within one of the villages at Great Neck. And I know that in you know, New York City, for instance, they have you know, one department, and here we're just so fragmented in, in many departments. Is there any way that we could do something to more centralize the building oh, department? Because people, business owners and landlords, it's not fair for them to have to wait you know, six weeks, seven weeks, three months, nine months to get permits to do projects. And you know, ultimately, these projects will bring in, or these new stores, or development sites will bring in lots of tax revenue, something that our unfortunate Broke County really needs. So, I, you know, I know this is a loaded question and you've yeah. probably heard this from real estate people before, but if there's a way that we could do something about centralizing the building departments and, and helping getting uh, permitting through, that would be just, you know, be amazing for uh, locally and on a county level, uh, the areas that are really need new new stores and new development sites. This, yeah, it's such an important issue. I was just speaking with NARI. It's a, it's a trade group that deals with home improvement. And they were talking about how complicated it is for permits for them to do the work if they're in a village, in the town, in the city, whatever, in the county, whatever it is. And, you know, people always talk about, like, let's, maybe if we work together, if we streamline this, or if we have one thing for all of us, but it never quite takes. 
So we've convened, we're going to convene a very small, very high level group, you know, one representative from each of the, each of the uh, towns, the cities, and maybe one person from the Village Officials Association, just to begin that conversation of how we can do that. Um, and perhaps it can be more with building as well. We can, we can look at that as well. Uh, the, 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 trick, the tricky part is each of these municipalities covets what it does and what it is in charge of. And I'm curious to see if with, through this conversation if any of them are willing to open that up a little bit and work together. It's, it's sort of in the embryonic stage right now, but it's absolutely a conversation that has to be had. And so I was speaking with this group and it came to me, well, why don't we keep talking about it? Why don't we just start it? So I've directed Greg May, who is my Office of Consumer Affairs guy, and my economic development team to, to, to convene this group to start this very conversation. If they would like any insight from the broker's point of view, yeah. or the landlord's point of view, I would be more than happy to, uh, to be a part of okay. that. Okay, have you got a card? Do I have a card? I've got 20 <laughs> of them, I expect to give out tonight. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Just give, yeah, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, What's your I name? Just, I'm Judy Epstein. Hi, I, Judy. I have a humor column with blank slate, but this is, this is not for that. I live here yeah. on the Gold Coast. Lovely. I defy you to come and find gold on my property. <laughs> I just want to draw attention to some language you've used, which I'm afraid is a clue to an assumption that you're making. Uh-oh. I'm nervous. Um, I listened very carefully to your talk at the top about property, grieving taxes, yeah. it's the reassessment, etc. And I've been through it once before, so I listened carefully with backstory. And you made it, you, you, right near the beginning of your talk, you said something about if a taxpayer grieves their tax. Grieve their assessment. Grieves their assessment, yeah. which ends up in a tax. Yeah. If they grieve their assessment. And then I think the very next sentence, you were saying something about, therefore they are underpaying. That's an assumption. That is an assumption. If somebody's grieving and their assessment is reduced. Fair enough, Judy, fair enough. Don't point reduce taken. it if it's not fair. Point taken. My, I guess my point was if they grieved year after year after year and they saw the value further degrade, that's what I was talking about. Well, but you're absolutely right. There are some cases where they grieved, and it was, you know what, that was actually correct. For whatever reason, well taken. people are grieving, and if the grieving, yeah. grievance is And granted, I would never blame anyone. Well, the thing is, if, at all for if doing it's it. given, give it if it's fair. Don't give it if it isn't fair. But the assumption that it, because you're see, therefore the underpaying. Is, under the previous system, they, there was a different formula that was used at ARC that basically 80% of the time you'd get a reduction, not necessarily on the merits, but because it was a better formula. Well. But <laughs> your point is still well taken. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, we have, um, we're gonna have time for one more question. And afterward, we're going to have refreshments outside. So we can invite and perhaps continue the discussion there, but our time here has coming to an end, so we'll, we'll take this final question. So it's all, it's pressure's on. You're it in. has to be a very good question. What's your name? Uh, Lou Zacharis. Lou? Madam, Madam Executive. Pleasure. Um, as one of the 50% uh, whose uh, tax impact notice uh, indicated that my taxes would be going down, um, I, I, I'm, I wasn't very happy with the uh, five-year phase-in yeah. that uh, and, and when Mr. Plank posed that, uh, uh, that question to you, I found your, uh, your answer to be more like, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll take what we give you and you'll like it. Um, I, I don't think the same sympathy is being given to those of us whose taxes are going to go down as uh, those who are, who are, who's are going up. Um, you borrow things for a lot of money, why don't you borrow money to give back to your uh, so to the people So this is an excellent question, down. and I have a number here. I was just looking, wanted to make sure I get it right. So we're still under NIFA control, and I would love to get an automatic fix. I would love to do this now instead of, you know, in one year instead of five years. We looked at how much that would cost. 
It's $770 million to make those in your category whole quickly. $770 million. We got about a seventh of that 18 years ago, right, for the bailout, and that gave us NIFA, and we're still under NIFA control. So the possibility of somehow finding or borrowing or getting from the state, 770 million, I hate to say it, it's just not, I don't, uh, we to, don't have it. To repeat Mr. Blank's question, uh, why should any of us have to wait? And why should the other half get a, get a five-year phase? I, I don't know if I'm gonna even be living in Long Island right. in five years. I mean, because you know, the levy is the levy. We have to make, we have to make the levy. Yeah, um, I, I understand, and to, to rip the Band-Aid off for, exactly. for everyone why else? Why does it have to be over a five-year, why can't it be a two-year period? Why can't it be right away? Why can't it be three years? Uh, if you get, you know, one goes up, one goes down, it balances. I hear you. I mean, with, this, is the, this, is the, this is the bad situation that we're in because of years of neglect and years of mismanagement. And it took us eight years to get into this mess. And unfortunately, it's going to take us some time to get out of it. But we have to start now. If we waited, it would only be more difficult and more painful for everybody. We've got to start with what we got now. I can't, I wasn't here, we can't relive, we can't remake the past. We've got to deal with the reality as it is now and then make the best of it. And that's what we're doing. Okay, I think that brings us to a close Thank of you our, very much uh, for of your our on the record community Thank forum. You. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to thank County Executive um, Curran for taking the time and for you also coming here and spending the time and your very good questions.